Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us this morning. My name is Greg Newman. I'm the Corporate Communications Manager for World Council of Credit Unions. And this is WOKU's first uh, webinar, bi-monthly webinar, on the COVID-19 Response Committee. Uh, we will be hosting bi-monthly webinars for credit unions throughout the world to help them get through the COVID-19 pandemic over the next few months, uh, over the next year, I should say, uh, with bi-monthly webinars. And this first webinar we are putting on with the help of the National Credit Union Found Federation of Korea. Um, it is on the current status of the COVID-19 pandemic and the future of international cooperative work. We thank you for joining us this morning. We're gonna take a look at the current status of COVID-19 with a global perspective on the outlook of the pandemic. Dr. Dong Il An, visiting professor of Yonsei University Graduate School of Public Health will be giving a presentation on that. He is also a former WHO representative in Cambodia and Laos. And then we will get a presentation on the present and future international work related to the virus. And that presentation will be from Gusen Kwan, Professor of Global Development Cooperation at Seoul Cyber University. As I mentioned, we are putting on this first bi-monthly webinar for the COVID-19 Response Committee with the National Credit Union Federation of Korea. And they are joining us as well this morning. And their CEO, Mr. Yun Sik Kim, who also chairs our COVID-19 Response Committee is joining us and he would like to say a few words as well this morning. I'll hand it over to you, Mr. Kim. 네, 안녕하세요, uh, hello, everyone. I am the, uh, really happy to meet you through this webinar. I am uh, the chairman uh, of uh, NAFCO, and uh, I am also serving as the chair of the uh, COVID-19 community of uh, uh, World Council. Credit unions around the world are being financially impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, and the daily lives and the health of credit union employees are at risk. During uh, uh, this uh, time of crisis, so like uh, today, credit unions are trying to its uh, uh, resilience and we need uh, to come up with the ways to overcome this crisis as a global movement. I think that that's why you are joining today's webinar. I hope that today's webinar provides you with a valuable insight. I understand that the many credit unions are greatly impacted by wildfire that is raising along with the Pacific coast of North America. The wildfire uh, comes amid uh, the ongoing the pandemic, making the lives of credit unions even harder. I hope all of you credit union members and the employees are safe and well and suffer no harm. I sincerely hope that things will get better soon. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Kim. We appreciate that. And uh, on behalf of World Council, thank you for helping us set up this first webinar for credit unions across the world through the COVID-19 Response Committee. Our first presentation today, as I mentioned, is on the current status of COVID-19 and a global perspective on the outlook of the pandemic. Dong Il An, visiting professor from Yonsei University Graduate School of Public Health and also a former WHO representative in Cambodia and Laos, joins us now to give that presentation. Dr. An. Thank you, uh, Mr. Greg, and uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Kim, for inviting me for this uh, uh, very important uh, uh, webinar. It's my great pleasure. Since this is a first uh, kickoff webinar, I believe it will be useful for, useful for everybody to present and discuss the overview on the COVID-19, focusing on future scenarios and best practices to set the stage of the series of the webinars uh, uh, in coming months, as uh, the Greg Newman indicates that. Uh, next slide. This slide is well known to many people. Uh, as uh, we know that around 27 million of total confirmed cases as of 7th of the September we have. And then however, we understand altogether globally around uh, at least to five or six percent of the whole uh, global uh, populations uh, are infected. So that means around 450 or 500 million it means only uh, around uh, one out of 20 seems to be reported and detected. So that we have to consider when, when we see these uh, actual uh, reported cases. 
And then you can see in the right uh, one that the current, uh, dri current uh, epidemics are derived by American region with uh, yellow color and the Southeast Asia region with the purple colors. American region here means the U.S. as well as uh, Southern, uh, South, South American countries like Brazil and Mexico and Chile, so and so. Southeast Asia uh, includes India, Bangladesh and Pakistan. Uh, next slide. Next time, please. Since every country has a different population size, so it is important to see how many cases per uh, fixed number of the population. In, in this slide, you can see per million people, how many are uh, uh, come from the cases, and you can see continuously compared to the March of the 26th in the left one, and then the right one is the uh, very recent period, and you can see uh, increase of the cases per million as well, and the dark color, dark purple colors, uh, South America and the North American region, as well as Southeast Asia. Next one, please. Next slide. This is a trend of the daily case of so-called the Big 12 in terms of uh, highest number uh, among the, uh, the countries. And then uh, seven out of 12, uh, Big 12 are from the American region and uh, uh, other Asia and Africa also in, included here. You can see here that most of the countries uh, is the increasing trend, except uh, perhaps uh, South Africa, left bottom areas, there is a, uh, one single curve, and then the right bottom areas, Spain, which uh, demonstrates two curves. Other than that, most of the big 12 countries continuously cases are increasing, unfortunately. Next turn slides. So, Here I made some four groups uh, depending on the epidemiological pattern and trend. Uh, group one is uh, the country which indicate continuously uh, uh, increasing numbers. And uh, uh, as you can see here, India and Argentina and Indonesia, United States also I belong to, uh, to me is belong to group one because the uh, first curve, uh, it looks like first curve and second curve, but uh, actually to me it's more fluctuation of uh, continuous of the uh, continual increase. All these countries uh, belong to uh, first group, which is the most challenging uh, countries. And then they somehow fail to reach the first curve, a uh, very clear first curve. And then so it is important to see peak of the first curve and then the downsizing uh, later on. So that hasn't uh, reached in these country groups. Group two is the uh, most promising countries because they have shown us the, uh, their pattern is only single curve so far. South Africa did a good job. So single curve and now uh, at the, the uh, end of the first curve. Taiwan uh, also, the, they uh, had uh, some uh, first uh, curve, but then uh, sporadic cases uh, uh, here and there, but uh, very low levels, less than uh, 20 or 30. New Zealand did a good job after first curve in, in March, and then now uh, they had no cases for uh, two, three weeks, and then now they have some few 10, 20, uh, very uh, small number of cases. China is also another uh, uh, the countries. Initially, yes, it, it is China who uh, which started in, in this country, but uh, uh, over the last seven to eight days, China had no local transmission reported and only a few of the imported case. So President Xi Jinping has uh, <coughs> celebrated their current situation just a few days before. Next one, please. Group three means uh, uh, the countries which uh, the pattern indicators that uh, there are two uh, curves following the first curve in March, around March. So most countries in Europe in these cases, they have uh, adopted the uh, shutdown, uh, very heavy uh, restriction of the people's movement. Then with that effect, uh, May, June and the July uh, cases decrease definitely, but now 
after lift of the uh, shutdown and the summer vacations, so and so. Now, this country, we see the second curve, uh, Spain, but uh, definitely Italy also. France, we see the second curve is bigger. Although I didn't put here, but the Swiss, Japan and Israel all follow the pattern of the France. So the second curve, they have a bigger than the first curve. So actually, Swiss is the first country recently applied the nationwide shutdown again in Europe. And if uh, question uh, for okay, uh, Greg also indicates that if you have any question or some comment, put uh, your comment or question in the. Q and A, so that uh, uh, Q and A, so the uh, I can respond and we can come back uh, after presentation. South Korea, uh, the recently I had uh, some second case, uh, so we belong to group three. Group four is kind of the hybrid, uh, and then the mixture of uh, group one, group two, and something. And it will be useful to see the Sweden which uh, the country which uh, tried to uh, establish the so-called herd immunity with very light uh, social distancing. And now, uh, because of their population is smaller than UK and uh, Spain and uh, France, so the number is not that high, but uh, the trend is now uh, much less than the uh, two, three months before. So let's see whether they are uh, current uh, different strategy, different uh, policies are working well or not, and there are a lot of uh, debate and the different views going around on this uh, uh, Sweden case. And the next slide, please. Uh, I'd like to move towards the vaccine and uh, uh, in vaccine, for vaccine, there are three uh, burning questions to everybody. Uh, next one, please. First question would be when the COVID vaccine will be available. There are many uh, different views going around and uh, for example, Bill Gates indicate end of the next year is the time to have the, the vaccine and but uh, uh, in my analysis uh, from most reliable sources, uh, my conclusion is that uh, all these uh, uh, many different sources telling me that we, it is very likely to have a vaccine, a COVID vaccine, perhaps middle of next year. And if uh, uh, we are lucky, then perhaps early of next year. So somehow early to middle of next year, we may have the vaccines uh, more with the mass production. Now, second question on the vaccine is whether, uh, no, 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 the previous one, thank you. Second question would be whether uh, US government will uh, uh, open the door for emergency use or not, following the China and the Russia. Actually, China uh, approved the emergency use even before the uh, completion of uh, clinical trials. And then from the July, the, the approval was in June, and the, from the July, some soldiers and uh, workers going to foreign countries are given the vaccination now. And it's kind of experimental uh, during they are, they, they are under the phase three of the clinical trials. Uh, and the Russia also uh, indicated that uh, they, uh, they would start uh, from the August and then the uh, two specific uh, populations such as teachers and specific groups. Question is uh, uh, US. The, we, we know that uh, uh, currently uh, the president of the US uh, indicate his wish to have a uh, uh, vaccine emergency use uh, possibly from a couple of days before the election. And also uh, we know that uh, vaccine became the game changer because after social distancing and the stay at home very hard options, still a lot of challenges and the contact tracing and the active uh, test and the tracing is not that easy. We found that some countries wear the, wear the mask, but some countries by cultural reason and many other reasons, uh, wearing the universal mask is not the uh, option also. So vaccine seems to be the only option uh, which could convince and then the, uh, change the whole game of the COVID uh, situation. 
So vaccine now become the game changer, something like a nuclear weapon in World War II. And then uh, obviously there are some domestic uh, uh, the politics in, in many countries, but also between G2, uh, US and then China, uh, continues the, the uh, following the trading competition and the IT areas. Now vaccine is on other areas. Uh, now you can see here that out of many trials, the eight uh, big pharmaceutical companies, uh, they are now carrying out the third stage of the clinical trials. Uh, so three are from the Western countries, one from UK, one from US, and another one German. And the three out of seven, uh, out of four are from the four, four or out of seven, eight are the, from the China. Uh, the AstraZeneca and the Moderna from UK and US are known most advanced, but recently AstraZeneca discontinued because of some side effect, but also I heard that a couple of days before they restarted. In China, Sinovac, uh, the second one in China, they have, uh, oh, no, no, the previous, yes, uh, Sinovac, they have uh, indicated that uh, 500 million uh, buyers from uh, different countries have requested uh, have been requested to the Chinese government to, to provide the, this vaccine. So they plan to uh, distribute to soon after they complete this emergency use. So the, the question is whether US uh, would uh, uh, allow this emergency use for kind of experiment, experimental uh, vaccine even before phase three uh, completed or not? That is a, a big question and uh, uh, let's see. Uh, next slide, please. So the question related to the vaccine to me is the how to secure this uh, game changer by different countries. I think that there are two possible uh, ways. One is a market approach. And second one is uh, consider vaccine as a public goods rather than putting onto the market. Market approaches, most, uh, most G7 countries very active on that and uh, has been investing a huge amount of money uh, for, uh, for uh, securing market in advance by uh, investing to the pharmaceutical companies. But however, uh, many countries and also some international organizations uh, uh, try to uh, ensure equitable access to COVID vaccine by many countries as much as possible. So then that they have established the so-called COVAX, uh, meaning Corona vaccine, the COVAX facility about two months ago. Uh, and then for that, the WHO and the Gavi Global Alliance for Vaccine Initiative and CEPI, uh, uh, the, they are working together. And now 75 countries have joined this uh, effort and the they are plan is to secure 20% of the these countries population would have the vaccine by uh, by using collective purchasing power from these 75 countries so this are the current situation with that let me further move towards the uh, future scenarios next slide please So for the leaders in, in credit unions and uh, senior people and policymakers, I think it will be interesting to see what kind of future uh, looks like and what kind of scenarios uh, looks like. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. <clears throat> we may consider uh, around four possible scenarios. This uh, this is not that difficult. Actually, uh, Brian Resmi, who is a well-known scientific journalist, uh, he already put uh, a frame of this one uh, uh, in March, 7th of the March, and I further developed these slides. And then, so the first scenario would be containing this virus as like human beings uh, contain and eliminate the SARS and Ebola. But the Ebola and SARS, before they reached the pandemic, it was possible, but once uh, any virus or any disease uh, became the pandemic, then it's very difficult, very difficult to eliminate uh, pandemic stage, stage. So 
Perhaps uh, as an exception, a couple of few countries might be the case, and currently China seems to be close to this. As I said, that there is no local transmission over the last seven to ten days. New Zealand uh, had declined, had claimed uh, no cases of, uh, around June and July, and now they have some few cases. Uh, but this is uh, very challenging and uh, perhaps uh, temporarily, yes, but uh, permanently, I'm not sure. We have to see. Unless they are ready to, some kinds are ready to compromise the economy, their economy uh, very heavily, it is not uh, uh, smart options. That is uh, my sense. And scenario two and scenario two, three is very similar. Uh, with herd immunity, this epidemic, moving towards and becoming uh, endemic. Endemic meaning this virus is going to live with, uh, with human beings or uh, we, we human, humans are living uh, uh, with viruses as like uh, we, we have uh, uh, influenza, seasonal influenza every year, we have HIV viruses and the tuberculosis like that are just part of the uh, human uh, being's life. They, they will uh, stay with us. Second scenario is uh, e with the uh, expansion of current natural infection. Once uh, uh, the, around the 60% or 65% of the global population became uh, got infected, then it is likely that the virus would be no more spread out. There are some, some uh, the uh, medical science uh, 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 knowledge on that. And then, the, as like the Spanish flu in uh, 1918, when they reached the 30 percent of the infection all over the world, uh, it stopped because uh, uh, around that time, many others and all the population already infected with other types of the flu over the last decades, so that the 30 percent was enough to uh, to develop the herd immunity because of some uh, cross immunity. But this uh, uh, coronavirus is a very noble new virus. So we understand that uh, nobody had uh, immunity so far. So the idea is uh, to, to get the herd immunity. Uh, necessary, necessary level for, for that would be around 60 to 65% of the global population uh, should be infected, unfortunately. And then Sweden is moving uh, that direction. So the scenario is uh, uh, with the vaccine, uh, uh, vaccine, maybe we don't know, but uh, at least 50 percent of the uh, effectiveness, or perhaps 7 to 80 percent of the people who get the vaccine, would get the immunity. Then the actual scenario three would be mixed with scenario two. So in addition to the natural infection, uh, by applying the by uh, vaccination campaign, more people uh, may reach the uh, 60 to 65 percent of the uh, herd immunity threshold, then the global community would be safe. And the fourth uh, scenario is something I don't like to, uh, to tell too much, and it's uh, endemic, but uh, human beings uh, are not necessarily uh, being, uh, that, I mean, the, we, we, our immunity not well developed, so only incomplete or partial immunity developed either by vaccine or by natural infection, but it is less likely. Because uh, although virus may be mutated, so it is uh, unlikely to go with uh, scenario four. But in theory, yes, scenario four is also possible. Okay, the, let me have the next slide. Next one is, uh, uh, I'd like to share the, uh, one interesting uh, slide from the Minnesota uh, University, well-known, uh, the Mayo Clinic groups that uh, CDREV is uh, uh, some uh, communicable infection uh, policy lab in, in, in Minnesota University. They, in, uh, in, in, in April, they have already uh, uh, developed scenarios and actually for this job, they well known the epidemiologist from the Harvard Listics or somebody there. He has joined this effort and then there are three possible scenarios in 2020 and 2021. So coming two years, uh, they uh, presume the three types of the different uh, uh, curves may be coming. And then the first curve is, the first scenario is uh, big curves on and off. And this big curve means uh, uh, the 
each time we need uh, uh, shutdown or very strict uh, restriction of the movement. Otherwise, uh, we may move to the uh, scenario two, really huge big uh, waves. So to avoid it, as like uh, many of the European countries did it, and uh, so the, uh, the nationwide shutdown or lock, uh, landlock policy should be applied each time. Very painful. And uh, so now in Europe, when they have a more uh, second uh, curve, they are a bit uh, uh, dilemma whether to apply the nationwide uh, the shutdown policy again or only localized area specific uh, partial lockdown like this. There's a, a debate now. And what the, in this scenario one, we need uh, uh, each time very uh, strong uh, enhanced social distancing or shutdown. It means each, each time the, the economy and the business uh, would be very much affected. That is the uh, not necessarily good, uh, good scenarios at all. Scenario two is the current, the, the, this November, December and uh, early next year in winter season in, in North Hemisphere we would have a huge single curve. So actually uh, in the group one, do you remember group one that the continuously increased? That is uh, somehow uh, only part of the uh, very left to one of the scenario two. And then uh, in, in November and December, uh, in the winter time, there will be huge big uh, first curve would be coming. That is the kind of the uh, potential risk group one has. And then this uh, scenario two in this uh, uh, slide uh, is something like that. And actually this is very similar to Spanish flu in 1918. They had a huge curve in the second, second peak and then 70% of the all uh, deaths, uh, the 30 to 40 million deaths happened in the second, second big huge, uh, huge curve and then people worry about these scenarios and it is possible some of the group one which I indicate uh, earlier slide moving to this direction so that we have to be uh, very careful and uh, uh, fall into this uh, scenario two. So scenario one and scenario two both are not good. Scenario three is uh, uh, actually the scenario three but uh, it, 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 it looks like scenario two but the very last scenario small curves. So after initial some big curve then continuously we would have small curves. So we don't need to uh, enhance the social distancing nor nationwide shutdown again. Each time to be very light, uh, light uh, social distancing might be enough. You recall that uh, New Zealand and uh, China and other countries group two, they had the first curve and then now they are enjoying a uh, low level of the uh, new infection. We are talking about that one in this uh, small curve scenario. So that uh, after first big curve, and then the, here it looks like not that small, but the very low levels of the uh, new cases. So we don't need to uh, consider too much the business shutdown or uh, so that uh, we can mitigate the uh, economic uh, situation and uh, uh, improve the economy in, in coming months and coming years. That's the best scenarios. And then so current group two countries are more near to this uh, uh, scenarios and they may have to uh, uh, try to uh, continue keep low level and then following this one. Next slide, please. Uh, next, next slide, please. Yeah, I like to sh spare a couple of minutes for uh, sharing the best practice. I have chosen New Zealand and Korea. Uh, before that, this is a very well known one, and the flattening the curve is a well known concept. And then for that, we have four possible uh, policy options. The, as you can see, the border control is one, but the border control is, uh, uh, cannot be perfect. And you know, somehow, somewhere, uh, the virus is coming. So then the, once it comes, then we have only three options. Government job is to uh, carry out the uh, active testing and the tracing in order to isolate the patient and put the uh, cross-contacts 
uh, under quarantine or self-quarantine. That is the first one. And second one is the left low and the individually uh, is very important to have a personal, uh, enhancing personal hygiene by applying, uh, by practicing hand washing and the mask. I do know that and the, the mask, wearing the mask, particularly the universal uh, mask wearing is uh, very sensitive to some countries and a lot of debate still and demonstrations. So that looks simple, but uh, it may not work in some countries or some cultural background. Right at the bottom is the community. Uh, the community members and the community as a whole or the country as a whole. Uh, we need the social distancing, including the landlock or uh, the, the school closures and the business shutdown and stay at home and working from home, all that. Out of the three, uh, next slide. Next slide. What New Zealand has applied is uh, social distancing and border control. Only part of the February, they have lived their country situation. They conclude that their capacity for testing and the tracing is a uh, uh, very weak and very uh, uh, very fragile. So they cannot. They they had no uh, test kit and very limited, and the, they don't have the manpower for tracing, uh, contact tracing. So they thought uh, better not uh, rely on this testing and tracing for isolation and the quarantine the patient. Then also they knew that uh, wearing the mask is not part of their culture, so almost impossible to pushing this wearing mask to their people. So New Zealand government from the beginning smartly decided, uh, forget about these two options, the only option uh, which would work in New Zealand setting, New Zealand uh, context would be uh, very strictly restrict the, uh, the control, the movement of people, so the shutdown policy, and also in addition to that, they have a very strong border control policy applied. From the beginning, uh, they, they closed down the airport and then mandatory quarantine from the beginning. So then as you see that in the right column that which is uh, uh, the published in New England Journal of the Medicine in June that uh, after a uh, big curve, actually it's not that big, you can see the, the number of cases only seven, less than 100. Uh, even considering the population size, it, this is uh, much, much lower than uh, many of European countries. And then, uh, and then the June, July, there are some few uh, imported cases. Okay, next slide, please. Next slide. And this is the case of South Korea. In South Korea, we have applied uh, totally opposite to New Zealand. We rely on the testing and tracing because uh, five years ago, we had a MERS uh, uh, crisis. And then when the MERS uh, Middle East uh, respiratory, respiratory syndrome attacked, uh, uh, and when our country was affected by that, we had practiced and we, we have known that the testing and the trace is very important. So we changed the uh, registrative, roles, the registrative laws and also uh, developed the good infrastructures for using the IT and, uh, and then also we, from the beginning, uh, we developed a test kit. So very, uh, move, very much moved to that direction and the wearing the mask to our people are not sensitive at all. As I said, five years ago, uh, marriage uh, changed our concept and then the mask uh, is to everybody. And also we had uh, the, some challenge of the, uh, uh, micro dust problems of the last uh, several years. So many people uh, wear the mask uh, uh, very often, and then and then our border has been opened and not well controlled. So that the initial few weeks and few months uh, still we open to China and uh, also the uh, not strictly controlled because we knew that the, any other people are coming and that we cannot stop it, and then so. Our board, other border country is very uh, uh, soft uh, way and social distancing. Our government decided only voluntary way stay at home. So it's just a recommendation and it's up to people. Uh, so we closed the schools, but the, most of the shops and the business not closed. 
and then the, we hardly pushed by the government to, to stay at home uh, mandatory. So we were able to go around easily. And then in the right, you see the result. And then the, uh, in Feb and March, we had the uh, initial first curve. After that, we uh, applied the enhanced social distancing after the release and the enhance again. And then recently, we had the second curve, and then, but we applied the same policy. So social distancing is uh, uh, the rather light compared to uh, whole uh, landlock in Western, uh, some of the Western countries. But uh, by aggressive testing and the tracing, uh, we were able to reduce it. And then next slide. Okay, and this is the uh, end of my, uh, the end of my uh, presentation and uh, which group Dr. Is Robin, in? Yeah. Th thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I know we talked about some questions in the interest of time, though. We're running a little long. Um, huh? So I was going to go ahead and uh, introduce our next speaker, if that's okay with you. Yeah, okay. The, my, my final word is that uh, I do know that uh, uh, COVID is the public health issue, but soon after uh, countries shut down, this is a matter of the uh, uh, library food matters and then the old and the, it is the economic uh, issue. So I believe it is very important. Uh, the World Council of the Credit Union uh, catalyze, play the catalyzed role to uh, enhance their uh, activities in, in credit union in many countries because there are informal sectors uh, very much affected by the uh, uh, landlocking policy and a lot of the uh, the library uh, the livelihood issue uh, uh, and uh, people are suffering by uh, economic reason before uh, rather than the uh, health issue. So in that sense, I uh, uh, wish to see the uh, very uh, crucial role of the credit union, particularly in many developing countries. Thank you very much. Well, Dr. An, thank you so much. It was a very enlightening presentation. I think uh, everybody has a good perspective if they didn't before on, on where we're going, uh, where we've been with this uh, pandemic and where we're going. Our next speaker is Gusun Kwan. He is a professor of global development cooperation at Seoul Cyber University. And he has a presentation for us on the present and future international work related to the virus. We'll turn it over to Dr. Kwan. Good morning and good evening, board member and delegate of World Council of Credit Unions. Uh, I'm very happy to make a presentation in this meaningful uh, teleconference. My name is Kusun Kwan, teaching at Seoul Cyber University, uh, Seoul in Korea. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. And also, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Mr. Yoon Shik Kim, uh, president of NACFOG and chair of COVID-19 Committee of WACU for inviting me to uh, this webinar. Well, I'm an old boy of Korean credit union movement back to 1997 to 2001, but I am still a member of uh, primary credit union in Seoul. So I can say that once credit union member, always a credit union member. The title of, uh, title of my presentation is COVID-19 Pandemic and Future of International Development Cooperation based on the case of the Republic of Korea. Uh, this is the order of my presentation. Uh, let me tell you my story uh, when I worked for the NACFOG 1997 to 2001. As you know, uh, the ICM financial crisis overwhelmed throughout the world. So uh, I witnessed um, collapse of uh, hundreds, uh, a few hundred of cr uh, primary credit unions and restructuring and reorganiza reorganization of NACFOG and the late of my colleagues. So it's a really painful moment. Uh, but at least we knew that what should be done to get to exit of this crisis. However, this COVID-19 is more 
uh, chaotic, and we actually lost the way to get to the uh, end state of this COVID-19. According to the World Bank 2020, a uh, historic contraction of per capita income since 1870s. Uh, it tells 5.2% um, contraction of global GDP in 2020. Uh, in, in regional base, minus 0.5% of Asia Pacific region is bit it, it, it's a little bit better, uh, but minus 7.2% of Latin America and minus 7% in advanced economy and two point, minus 2.5% 2 2 in emerging and developing economy. But the problem is this emerging and develop, developing economy uh, are quite vulnerable to economic uh, headwinds from the advanced economy. So actually COVID-19 is a global health risk, but it gave, it is giving an impact on economic recession. So finally, it's a, a social protection for the vulnerable people, in particular the low income class and uh, the most vulnerable people in, 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 in conflict areas such as internally displaced persons and, and refugees in humanitarian, global humanitarian arena. Many countries adapted uh, measures to contain COVID-19, for example, social distancing, uh, lockdown, and testing and tracing, and herd immunization, immunization is a let it be strategy uh, like uh, Sweden, but results are varied. To reduce this long-term effect of epidemic worldwide, development cooperation as a token of international solidarity and cooperation is needed more than ever. So many donor countries already reallocated their official development assistance. We call ODA to meet the basic human needs and uh, support emergency health facilities and provide uh, financial liquidity to developing countries. Korea, as a donor country, has shifted its ODA to support partner countries' a quick response to COVID, like dissemination of the lessons learned from K quarantine, we call core Korea quarantine policy and strategies and technical assistance and provision of necessary medical supplies and equipment. So, these circumstances, um, my presentation will cover. Um, historical background and governance structure and implementing mechanism and volume for Korean ODA uh, to help you to understand the general outline of Korean ODA. And secondly, COVID-19 pandemic and international development cooperation context of the world. The third, uh, Korea's aid response to COVID-19 in some cases. Okay, according to uh, Korean government economic policy, the process of the economic development can be divided into four stages. First is a recovery, state, recovery phase, uh, just after the Korean War to 1961. The takeoff phase is since 1962, 72, and, and uh, heavy and chemical industry promotion phase. And then finally, nationalization and liberalization phase in 1980s. So, as you know, Korea has no any sufficient natural resources. We had only human resources. So our government trained uh, and mobilized some skilled worker and skilled labor to uh, uh, tuning to economic priority and goals. As you see, um, 1950s per capita income in Korea is $63. Is, uh, the least developed country like LDC. And 2019 is reached 34,000 US dollar per capita income. It's 500 times as much as the per capita income in 1950s. In the meantime, let me draw your attention. The Korean credit union movement uh, was established in 1961 in the recovery period, recovery phase. So it's mobilizing members to share capital and saving to local farmers and small shop owners who used to uh, be dependent on the money lender, high interest 
uh, raid money lender. So it played a key role in developing and laying a foundation of the uh, socio socioeconomic development of the low and middle income class in rural and urban areas. You know, Korea had received almost 12.7 uh, billion U.S. dollar aid uh, from many donor countries and multilat multilat multilateral aid donor agency. Uh, in particular, uh, post-war reconstruction period, uh, we received mainly grant aid, 1945 to 1961. As you see the bar graph, uh, 1950 to 60, so almost a grant aid is a major um, ODA from donor countries. But uh, economic development and concessional loan, loans were provided by uh, international finance institution and other donor agencies. As you see the graph, 1960 is almost half to half, and 1970 is a uh, concessional loan and it became larger and larger. Then finally, we graduated from uh, status of recipient country in late 1990s. But in 1960s and 70s, a lot of development projects for the Korean credit union movement were implemented by bilateral and multilateral donor agencies and credit unions in advanced economy. Uh, please refer to these um, the project and programs from uh, many other donor countries. But let me uh, highlight the CUNA and CUNA Mutual Group and Labo Bank and Canad uh, Canadian Cooperative Alliance actually put efforts to uh, the cultivate credit union leaders and members and employees uh, during 1960s and 70s. As a donor, uh, 1960 and 70, even in recipient country, the Korea implemented the invitational training program and sent expert to other developing countries funded by um, donor agency and multilateral agency. So we call this a triangular cooperation uh, intervened by a donor agency. So, but since 1980s, uh, Korea uh, implemented some diversified, uh, some development programs with its own resources. So 1987, uh, our government established Economic Cooperation Development Fund, we call EDCF as a concessional loan program. And 1991, uh, found the Korean International Cooperation Agency is a bilateral donor agency. And finally, uh, Korea affiliate with the uh, OECD Development Assistance Committee in 2010. So now became a regular member of OECD DOC. Sorry. This is a governance structure of a Korean ODA. So due to time limits, let me skip uh, this slide. Yes, yeah, Korea um, has made uh, some country partnership strategy, the selected uh, core partnership countries. From 2016 to 2020, our government selected 24 countries, uh, the core partnership country. So next year to 2025, we selected new list of core partnership countries. Uh, so the list of uh, this partnership country will be updated. Current ODA volume, the fiscal year 2018, so reached 2.4 billion US dollar, including concessional loan and the grant program. Now move to uh, development cooperation in COVID-19 pandemic. Let's see the situation. COVID-19 is a humanitarian crisis but it is related to development risk because many donors reallocated their resources to respond to COVID-19, which means uh, the ODA resources, uh, which were designed to long-term development, uh, should be uh, turning to uh, this humanitarian assistance and other COVID-19 aid. So health and education, the nutrition system in developing country will be seriously damaged with the collateral impact. In particular, country with uh, uh, conflict zone and conflict stricken countries, uh, uh, which, had, which have a weak governance and lack of capacity to contain COVID-19 may accelerate conflict and fragility and, and 
possibly relapse to humanitarian emergency. So COVID-19 uh, would be a social, economic, and security threat to the globe. That's the reason why Mr. Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, um, demands uh, coordinated, decisive, and inclusive, and innovative policy action, and maximum funding, and financial, and technical support for the poorest countries. So this is the uh, some case of the donor countries, how they responded to this COVID-19. It's uh, France, um, this is uh, Germany, uh, this is the US, uh, United States. So let me skip this slide uh, due to the time limit. Please refer to my uh, the material. There are challenges and opportunity. Actually, ODA uh, was a peak of 2016, just after the launch of Sustainable Development Goals. But since then, the ODA, um, the volume is, is a slightly the fail. But I'm not sure next year uh, our global ODA reach some increase of the volume to uh, respond to COVID-19. But still, uh, United Nations, uh, uh, United Nations, uh, the quick response, uh, the funding program of two billion US dollar uh, still uh, didn't meet their goal, and the G20 Tele Summit. Uh, there is no any substantial agreement of the, the funding and financing for development. And World Bank, they have also uh, COVID-19, the financial facility, but there are so many conditionality in terms of the number of deaths and infected. So insufficient ODA is the first challenge, second bilateralism rather than multilateralism. So unilaterally and bilaterally, the country, donor country focus on bilateral base or the focus on domestic concern. It is uh, deteriorate multilateralism. The third the restriction of movement due to collapse of global supply chain. There are a lot of expatriates and volunteers and consultants who were deployed to uh, development country, countries now return to their home country. So project sites were empty. The movement of items is not that uh, speedy uh, before the COVID-19. And uncertainty of back to traditional development cooperation. Nobody can be sure that we can uh, come back to uh, traditional development cooperation. But there are some uh, positive uh, uh, perspective on, 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 on during the COVID-19. New forms of co cooperation, South and North cooperation, for example, China's supply to uh, Italy and their share of consultancy to Italy government. And East and West cooperation, for example, Russia uh, sends uh, medical supplies to the United States. It's a new form of cooperation. Also, South-South cooperation, a triangular cooperation uh, uh, will be uh, strengthened and reinforced. And humanitarian development nexus used to be a rhetoric. But nowadays, uh, COVID-19 um, show this type of risk is related to the humanitarian risk and also development risk is assured the humanitarian, humanitarian assistance and development is interconnected. And knowledge sharing and learning. So Global North is no longer uh, the best practice because uh, this COVID-19 uh, uh, shed light on the knowledge sharing from even the Global South. For example, Ebola outbreak case and SARS, MERS, is, will be a good reference. Those countries, uh, the case can be good refer uh, can be a good reference to advanced country. And importance of local ownership and revisited. So local ownership after uh, return to expatriate, the local community and NGOs and civil society uh, should take a more responsibility uh, for managing the project. So. Uh, this is uh, one of the uh, positive aspect of the uh, local ownership. Now, the Korea's aid response to developing country. Uh, this year, uh, last uh, 
uh, last May, the president of Korea, Mr. Moon Jae-in, uh, was invited to uh, 73rd World Health Assembly as a keynote speaker. He actually introduced uh, Korean quarantine as a main principle of openness, transparency, and democracy. And he also highlighted uh, solidarity and cooperation as the strongest weapon to fight against COVID-19. And he pleased uh, humanitarian assistance for countries with a vulnerable healthcare system and sharing our experience of the responding to COVID-19. So our government earmarked the concessional loan of uh, 130 million US dollar to Asia, Central and, uh, and South America and also African countries through a trusted, trusted fund scheme uh, with the uh, uh, International Finance Institute. It also committed the grants of 29.9 million US dollar to humanitarian assistance and healthcare operation. And and, and, and I'm very happy to uh, say that our government announced a budget request, uh, uh, 8 804 million US dollar uh, was made to uh, propose to our National Assembly, but it depends on the uh, decision of National Assembly. Uh, the 5% of increase in the, the year, uh, fiscal year 2020. So it will be uh, dispersed to further expand in strategic and humanitarian ODA in 2021. And also uh, our government adapted a new agenda. We call the agenda for building resilience against COVID-19 through development cooperation. We call ABC program. So A stands for act, action on fragility. Uh, B is uh, building capacity. The C uh, means comprehensive cooperation to save lives and, and ensure safe livelihood. So this ABC program uh, is divided into two phases. The first phase is a response phase uh, from 2020 to 2021, and the resilience period, the 2020, uh, at 20, uh, uh, three to, to four. So each stage, each program, uh, please refer to my uh, material. Um, let me skip this part. So let me give you some example and the case of uh, the Korean aid program to respond to COVID-19. Actually, the uh, requested by Uzbek government, our government deploy uh, this is contra expert to uh, Uzbek task force uh, to fight against the COVID-19. So uh, our experts um, share uh, K quarantines and also technical cooperation and consultation on uh, Uzbek, uh, 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 Uzbek COVID-19 response. So there is a good outcome of, uh, of the Uzbek government uh, took a preventive measure uh, not to spread uh, this COVID-19. And actually, Korean government joined the Global Health Security Agenda in 2014, uh, which was initiated by U.S. government. So um, uh, since then, the Korea uh, participated in a lot of uh, capacity building and awareness and the technical cooperation program. One of the examples in Ghana, uh, Korea, uh, Korea expert and expert from U.S. Uh, Center for Disease Control, CDC, implemented um, uh, some training program, health workers in northern part of Ghana. So um, most of graduates uh, uh, actually were assigned to uh, test and tracing and data management and education of uh, educa uh, health education program in northern part of Ghana. It is one of the outcome of the uh, this kind of training to disease control. And also our government mobilized um, uh, from the. Uh, uh, through the diplomatic channel, we, we sent uh, uh, emergency medical supplies to our partnership countries, uh, including um, the mask and test kit and sanitizers. Those medical emergency medical items were distributed to uh, our partner countries. 
And social enterprise and cooperative. The first case is a uh, free bill in Blancan, Pro Blancan province in the Philippines. Actually, this free bill was established the migrant, domestic migrant from uh, move to remove to uh, uh, the urban area for the urban planning or natural disaster. So this is a poverty, poverty stricken community. But uh, the Korean uh, social enterprise funded by Koika started igniting. This is a Philippine uh, Tagalog word that's uh, igniting. So they actually established, uh, they actually trained the women for textile uh, skill and, and help them to establish a uh, textile producer uh, cooperative. So they can get together to uh, joint production and joint marketing and distribution. And in 2019, they finally established even credit union with 30 members. So they now maintain um, this kind of productive activity and income generation in a in, in sustainable base. So even, even in COVID-19, they uh, maintain their production uh, to get income through these activities. The sec second is the capacity building of a Tamale cooperative is the northern part of Kana. Uh, this is uh, since 2010, our government, uh, Koika, uh, implemented the capacity building of this cooperative program. Even though Korean expatriates returned to Korea, but their, their cooperative still worked very well. They reached the goal of the, their production goal. So it's, it's one of the example of the success, successful um, sustainability uh, was strengthened through the program. So Women Club for Income Generation in Uganda, the Korean NGO funded by the Korean government started the Women Club for the Income Generation. Uh, let me tell you, they actually requested by the UNHCR because this village is located near the refugee camp. So requested by uh, uh, UNHCR, UN uh, uh, Refugee Agency, to produce this ma this mask for refugee. So they actually manufacture this mask and distribute this mask to uh, international organizations, other the government uh, agencies. And ICT-based transformation, uh, the, uh, the Korean government implemented almost 300 uh, invitational training program. But due to COVID-19, they convert the online training. So our university, as an as a implementing partner of uh, government, we implemented the first online uh, training program to Cambodian teachers and civil society workers. And Khmer Academy for Online uh, Learning Program uh, was implemented by the Korean IT companies funded by Korean government. They actually uh, developed like mobile app uh, learning program because of the shutdown and, and close, closure of uh, schools, many students can access this mobile app program to learn mathematics, Khmer language, English, and etc. So it's, it's quite a uh, 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 good accessibility uh, from the, the school children in Cambodia. And Paraguay Education Pro uh, Broadcasting Program, also developed by Korean NGO and Korean Education, Education Broadcasting Service. So because of lockdown and the shutdown, so many of the students are not able to go to uh, the schools. So they actually air a uh, lot of subject to uh, children, uh, school children in Paraguay. So conclusion, um, nobody can tell the reality of a post-19 world and what, look, what development cooperation looks like next to five years. But economic recession and political pressure uh, will make countries, make countries uh, to be isolated and stick to national interest and unilateralism. But it is time to uh, get together. It's a strong global solidarity and cooperation must be ensured, not only to contain COVID-19, but promote recovery and resilience in the long-term uh, phase. The Korea as a donor country should continue to uh, share knowledges and know-how and learn from K-quarantine to developing world. 
and more importantly, need to play a catalytic role in exploring new and innovative approach of development cooperation, such as ICT for development and localization and effective distance and blended management. Credit union movement has been a, a reliable and trust partner of development cooperation worldwide. Under this COVID-19 pandemic, credit union movement will be the first and forefront result to ensure social protection for its members and community. So uh, let me highlight the cooperation among credit unions and other cooperative will enhance uh, credit union value and leadership role to strengthen resilience of the world we live in. Thank you for watching uh, my presentation. I'd like to welcome your comments and questions after this presentation. Again, thank you for joining. And we want to thank uh, Dr. Goosen Kwan for uh, joining us today and giving that great presentation. Um, really good information there and great information earlier as well from Dong Il on. Um, if you have any questions and you're still with us, and you want to ask a couple of questions of either Dr. On or Dr. Kwan, we're going over a little bit of time anyway. So if you'd like to do that, put them in the question and answer box. Right now, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Kim. Uh, Mr. Kim, first of all, thank you for setting up these speakers for us today. This is a great opportunity to hear from folks with the National uh, Credit Union of Korea, uh, the Federation there and everything that you've done and, and some of the things that are going on from Korea to the world. And I know you had a few comments of your own, so please go ahead at this time. Mr. Kim, uh, you're you're muted right now. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the World Council Secretariat. Uh, thank you so much uh, for organizing today's uh, webinar. And uh, also, I would like to thank uh, An dong -il and uh, Gong gu -sun, the both of the presenters. Thank you so much uh, for your insightful uh, presentation. And uh, above all, I would like to thank uh, all the attendees uh, who joined us uh, uh, from the all around the world. Uh, thank you so much uh, for sharing uh, uh, your time. I think uh, we have to continue to study uh, uh, the ways uh, wisely uh, uh, overcome and uh, deal with the current crisis until the vaccine is uh, finally available. I hope that today's webinar uh, could be a big help for you in understanding and finding better ways to respond to the current crisis. Uh, what you uh, will uh, organize a uh, webinar uh, on a bi-monthly uh, basis and that the next webinar will be in the November. If you have any topics that uh, you want to discuss uh, during this uh, webinar regarding the COVID-19, uh, uh, then uh, please uh, contact us or World Council. Thank you so much for your time today and uh, stay healthy and uh, safe. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kim, and that's a, that's a great comment. And if anybody does have anything that they would like to hear about in our November webinar for the, the bi-monthly webinar series that we have for the COVID-19 Response Committee, you can just email communications at woku.org, communications at woku.org. Um, it doesn't look like we have any uh, questions from the audience, um, but again, I wanna thank uh, the National Credit Union Federation of Korea. I'd like to thank Dr. dong Il An, and also uh, Dr. Gusun Kwan for their presentations. And I should mention that a uh, recording of this entire webinar is going to be available on the World Council YouTube channel later today. And that's very easy to find. It's just youtube.com slash woku, W-O-C-C-U, youtube.com slash woku. And we will be uh, sharing that on social media as well. So I wanna thank everyone and hope you have a good day and we'll see you in a couple of months with our next webinar.